visiting with us. We are, we have come to our third Victory Sunday. This year, the elders, in uh, looking for edification and ways to build up the church, decided to do three, set aside three Sundays throughout the year to uh, bring in a, a special speaker, one that uh, gives us kind of a fresh perspective on things, to encourage us and uplift us and prod us toward heaven itself. And we've had two wonderful speakers so far with Mike Vestal back in April, and then of course uh, in July we had Steve Higginbotham. Uh, but here we are in October. We have with us Brother Toby Secting from the church at Howe. And uh, I know that uh, Toby is one of my favorites. He's, he is one of the gentleman preachers that you, you see and you hear about. He's a man of the word. He's a man who loves God. Uh, he's done mission works. He's raised a wonderful family. He has uh, uh, strengthened the church and how where he's been preaching for 12 years. Is that right? A bunch. <laughs> Since 99. So it's, it's 15 years. So we're so thankful to, uh, to get Toby to come uh, speak to us, to encourage us. And without taking any more of his time, we'll turn services over to Toby. Well, all good things must come to an end. One victory is good. Uh, three victories uh, would be even better, wouldn't it? Uh, and so we'll see if we could pull the third one off uh, this morning. You're doing your part. Thank you for being here. Good to see you uh, this morning. Good to be with uh, Sam and, and uh, Russell and, and their families and all of you. And there's much, much more to, to be said about that. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll do that in, in due time. But uh, invite you this morning to to turn your minds uh, to the scriptures, and uh, we're going to present three lessons to you, if the Lord wills. Uh, we'll, we'll look this morning, first off, start off, title of the lesson is, More Important Than the Assembly, operating under the banner in a way of uh, uh, living, living as the church, or um, uh, living every day a, as members of the body of Christ, and then following this Bible class hour, after we look at these things more important than the assembly, uh, we're going to look at the, the subject matter of there's never been a better time uh, than now. Uh, then we'll close that uh, if the Lord allows us after we have our meal. Uh, we'll close the day out with a lesson titled, you've seen it already, Are You Ready? When my oldest son was four years old, 1980, I believe is the year, you can ask my wife Debbie uh, as to the details, uh, of the dates and that, but, but 1984, my son was four years old, born in 1980, it's 1984, that's it, I better get that straight, and uh, um, my mother decided to buy him a bicycle. He's four years old. I didn't get a bicycle till I was a senior in high school. I don't, uh, maybe it wasn't quite that long, but, but uh, it took me a while to get a bicycle. I was at least 7th or 8th grade, and uh, she still wasn't real crazy about that. And I said, he's four years old. <laughs> but she bought him the bicycle. Well, now, guess what? Assembly required. And so I, I have to put this bicycle together, and uh, my wife, Debbie, has taken Dustin on a little excursion for the next few hours so that I can put this bicycle together. I'm rushing through there trying to get it together. I know they're going to be home any minute. I think she kind of spilled the beans when she was out there with him somehow. Saying, Daddy's going to have something special when you get home or whatever it was, but, but I'm trying to get the parts together. Nothing, nothing's matching up. But finally, I get that thing assembled. Uh, I throw the box out in the garage. Uh, I push the bike behind the island in the kitchen. And about that time, the front door opens, and, and my timing was just perfect. And uh, here comes my wife and, and our, our oldest boy, Dustin, four years old at the time. And I wheel that bicycle out there to him after I'd spent all my time assembling that thing. And he said, you should have put a bow on it or something. I got a bow for you. Now, to him, there was something more important than the assembly. And you know, now I, this is a lousy uh, illustration to get started on, I guess, in some ways, because in, in his mind, there was something more important than the assembly. In my mind, the assembly was it. 
buddy, if, if you don't appreciate the assembly, then uh, I don't know how much more you're going to appreciate it, a bow if I put that on top of that. And so there's a, there's a whole uh, uh, um, uh, picture of the entirety of the brotherhood in that, that sermon illustration. But Paul, uh, I believe the, the author to be Paul, in, in his letter to the Romans says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approach. And there's where we begin to focus. As you look, isn't it nine times out of ten, we're going to look at this text, if we're going to preach this text, we're going to focus on this in an elders deacons meeting or a Bible class meeting, we're going to look at the idea of, well, the assembly is important. And, and we should not be forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It's a biblical truth. That's absolutely right. But for, for the time being, may I submit to you, there, there is something more important than the assembly. We ought to put a bow on it. Because, in fact, look back at the text. The, the author says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works and exhort one another. So there's a sandwich. The, the assembly is, is, we think of encompassing everything, and, and yet it's really the assembly that's in the middle of this uh, sandwich of Hebrews chapter 10, 24, and uh, 25. And uh, the idea is, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. See, there's something more important than just the uh, parking your carcass on a pew. Something more important than, the, and, and this assembly, I know my audience, here you are Sunday morning, here you are for Bible class, and, and I know that you get this. I know that you get there's something more important than just coming down to the church building and sitting on the pew for a while, but uh, we struggle to, to present this message to, to some of those who don't quite get it. And they're looking for a bow. <laughs> they're looking for something extra to be added to this, this assembly. And so uh, it is important for us to assemble. Uh, the lyrics of that song, Blessed be the tie that binds. I think it says it all. Blessed be the tie that binds, what? Our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like what? that above when we do it right when we are assembled as the body of Christ be it for Bible class be it for a fellowship meal be it for worship and each of those may have different degrees of importance or uh, emphasis in our life at different times but when we're assembled uh, it's important and it's got a bow on it uh, our our unity is, is that very thing which Jesus, in, in his distress in the garden, prayed for. Uh, among those things prayed for, one of those things was that we would be united, uh, that we would be assembled, that we would be bound together. And so, as the song says, we share each other's woes, our mutual burdens we bear, and often for each other there flows the sympathizing tear. Put a bow on it. It's important to assemble. The assembly is required. There is some assembly required, and, and it's important for us to do those things, but it's also important, as Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 points out, that there is something even more important than this moment of you just coming together. And we go back uh, and remind you, number one, the writer in that text says, one reason we come together is in order to stir up love and good deeds. Now, he didn't say that you come here in order for, for, to be stirred up, though that's certainly in there. He said you come together in order, the assembly is important, in order to stir up love and good works. Paul would say in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, 
Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a sincere heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere or pure faith. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, I know it's not the lust of the flesh, this love we're talking about, stirring up. I know that it's, it's uh, uh, Paul would say there are three great things now abiding, uh, faith, hope, and the greatest of these is what? Is charity or the idea of love. We come together in this assembly in order to stir up love uh, and good deeds. We love God. He deserves it. He's worthy of, of all the, the love that we could have one uh, uh, to, an, uh, to another for him. Uh, and in fact, what is that greatest commandment if we were to ask Jesus himself? You need to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then if you would like, it's not a direct quote from, from uh, any uh, certain translation, if you would like a second commandment that's very much like that, is not only do you people need to love God, You've got to find a way to love your neighbor as yourself. That's hard living in 2014. My neighbors, I'm not in as much agreement with my neighbors in 2014 as I was in uh, 2000. As I was assembling that bike in 1984, I don't feel like I've got as much in common with as many families in my neighborhood. Uh, and yet, shame on me because I've got every bit as much in common, if not more. I've got the, the, the commission or the, the commandments of God that I need to be concerned about them. And so we love God. We need to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We are in the scriptures, James chapter 2 and verse 5, that speaks uh, uh, about the idea of, of, of God's love for, for us. Consider, if you will, uh, open your Bibles, in fact, to uh, James chapter 2 and verse 5. I want you to look at, at the, the phrasing there. James 2 and verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Well, okay, let's lay down beside that John 14, 15, where Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. God has promised the, the kingdom to those that love him. If you love God, then you're going to want to obey God. If you love God, you're going to want to, to uh, get closer to God. And so uh, John would say, you know, if you don't love, you don't really know God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For what? God is love. It's more important than the assembly. The idea that behind it, you and I are here to stir up one another for love. I know we get it to each other. We love each other. We got a lot of things in common, but also outside of these walls. And our works need to be carried outside of these walls. I'm not as familiar with the West Hill congregation as I wished I was. We're just two hours apart, and so I don't get to spend as much time with you and in and, and fellowship and physical fellowship or physical proximity uh, as, uh, as I wish. But, uh, but I know you. I know your reputations. I know of your works. I, I know your preachers. I, I've met your elders. I, I've been associated with this congregation in a few years, uh, all, at least one, one day out of the year, and so I have some knowledge of you, but... Uh, uh, I would assume there's even room for us here to have to be reminded that Jesus said we're even supposed to love our enemies. We're not supposed to grow proud in the faith, not supposed to grow uh, uh, hardened uh, in our hearts towards the sin of the world to the point that, that we lose our love for the sinner uh, who is in that sin. Uh, 
Jesus said you're even supposed to love your enemy. That's, that's what separates Christianity. That's what makes it the supreme uh, choice for mankind. It makes it the only choice. It makes it the way, or it is that element of the way, the truth, and the life. And that is, we don't go into the world and, and seek somehow to, to take the world at, at, uh, at gunpoint. We don't go into the world and threaten the world and say, you're going to submit to Christianity or you are going to die. Instead, our Lord says to us, even those that, that spitefully use you and persecute you, even those that you are your enemy, you need to love them. And it just seems to me it's harder to do that today than it was 20 years ago. Well, shame on me, because God hadn't changed a bit. The Word of God hasn't changed a bit. The church, in fact, has not changed in the sense of the church as God views it and the church as, as purpose. It is that same mustard seed growing into this tree very slowly and silently and influentially. Uh, th those things have not changed. But listen, our culture is changing uh, every day at the drop of a hat. Uh, even some of the laws in our nation or the influence of, of our legislative bodies are seeking to change the laws in our nation and making some things that once were, were uh, considered, once were identified, once were acknowledged as being immoral, now our government is involved in the process of of, uh, of selling alcohol to make money, selling lottery tickets to make money, and now we've even moved into the moral realm regarding homosexual marriages. Well, what is my point? Uh, we need to be stirred up. And this assembly is very much about the stirring up of those around us. Ephesians 2 and verse 10 Let's lay, let's lay uh, three passages down here. Ephesians 2 and verse 10, the writer says, We are his workmanship, created for what? We're created for good works. Then in Titus chapter 2 and verse 7, Paul tells Titus, In all things show yourself to be a pattern of good works. And then it makes me think, makes us think of the Lord's words. You are the light of the world. You're supposed to go let your light shine so that they will, yes, see your good works, but ultimately glorify your Father in heaven. And let's lay one more down beside that. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I don't know I ever preach a sermon without getting in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, but there it is that not only is all scriptures given by inspiration of God, but why? So that you, so that I can be profitable, so that we can be perfected, so that we can be complete. And one of those things is that we need to love the world around us. Turn to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, and I want you to pause and gaze. I don't have that on the, the PowerPoint for you. I hope that you'll take occasions to open your own Bible and, and uh, see these things in your passages of the Scripture. But notice what is said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Not only are these good works that Christians are to be engaged in, not only are they good for us, they're good for our fellow man. Stir up one another to love and good works. Why? Because the congregation will benefit from it. Okay. Stir up one another to love and good works. Why? Because not only is it good for, for your fellow man, it's good for you. Not only is it good for us to help others with evangelism, benevolence, uh, and, and encouragement, but it's good for you. God wants us to be people who assemble, and in the assembly do a variety of things, but the Hebrew writer says it clearly, one of the reasons you are here or should be here is to stir up Um, 
I've been preaching longer than I would ever thought I'd said I've been preaching. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine some of those things, Sam, and how long it's been. I always thought of myself as a new guy and a rookie, and I don't know enough. And, well, here I am now, and I still don't know enough, and still sort of a rookie, but uh, our culture has changed in the last 10, it, culture always changes, but our culture is changing rapidly to a point where people are, have a sense of entitlement. Uh, people can come through these doors for a variety of reasons, but many times what they're coming through the doors for is obviously they want to be right with God or find some relationship with God but they also come here to see what are you going to provide for me? What do you got for me? What kind of programs have you got? What, what kind of love are you going to show me? Did you make me feel like I was welcome? And in and of themselves, uh, those things are, 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 are not necessarily wrong. We'll have more to say about that in, in following lessons. But our assembly is to stir up love and good work. Frankly, I don't think I'm alone. We get tired. We've been there. We've done that. We tried to help him. We tried to help him five times, and he keeps doing the same old thing, and, and it just doesn't see. Nobody ever says thank you. I, I, of, all the, of all the benevolence that, that I've been a part of with the Lord's church, Organized benevolence of congregations, and this goes for one, two, three, four, however many congregations. We've never received, to my knowledge, a thank you note. We never received the repayment that we said we were going to get. Oh, yeah, I'll send you the money as soon as I get home. We never received a repayment. We've never received a thank you note, save one. We did, a, a family did thank us for helping them as they were broke down on the side of the road, and we got them pizza and got them going again. But my point is, we all get a little bit weary. Uh, burnout is possible. And, and every one of us spends, if you will, a good time, a good deal of time alone. Not in this assembly. Not in the close proximity to our brothers and sisters where they encourage us. And so many times we're away from the body. And as we're uh, navigating through life, and we're trying to stay over here in the narrow way, and we're bumping into people that are in the broad way, and some of them are getting us caught up with them on occasion, and, and we're starting to, to move away from the narrow path. We live our lives uh, uh, with others, but there's a lot of time that we spend alone, and sometimes we, we, we do good deeds, but nobody seems to care. Sometimes uh, as an assembly, as the body of Christ in, in Corsicana or the body of Christ in this place, body of Christ, wherever we are, sometimes we love others and they just don't seem to love us in return. We do what we, do what we think we are supposed to do and we try our best to visitors that come or, or families that we're trying to reach out to and it just never seems to be enough. My point here is, you know, burnout happens. We get tired. Sometimes uh, we wait and we wait and we wait and we wait for people to respond to the gospel or we wait for them to give us an opportunity to say and do the things that we're supposed to be doing or, or that we need to do and, and we wait and we wait and they never respond. Well, it's, what's the use? But May I remind you also that sometimes we wait and we wait and we wait and we try and we try something a little different and then another brother or sister comes up and just says something that you would think never is going to have impact on the individual and lo and behold, they ultimately obey the gospel or repent and become faithful again to to the, the Lord. Well, 
I said I think we, we live in a time when many people come through our, our doors and they're looking to be stirred up. Well, it's, it's a good thing to stir them up. And may I remind you that if you will spend some time stirring others up, I suspect you'll be stirred up as well. See, if you've got an anxiety problem, if you've got a problem with, with hypochondria, or you've got this loop playing in your mind about all the regrets that you've ever had in life, and you just, you just coulda, shoulda, woulda, and, and this loop just keeps on playing and playing, and it's got you depressed, it's got you overcome with anxiety, it's got you overcome with regret, maybe what you need to do is change that loop. Maybe what you need to do is go to the hospital today and say, I want to volunteer for something. I want to volunteer to help the children. Maybe we need to say, we want to make sure that there's never another newborn in, in local hospitals that does not have a care blanket to take home with them and, and, a, few, and, a, and a packet of diapers, and whatever those things are. I know that diapers and a care blanket are not necessarily going to save a soul. We understand that. But there are a lot of people that need to be stirred up. And in the process of us doing those loving good works, sometimes it's us that gets stirred up the most. Think back to Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Interesting. Stir up. You know that word stir up? The, the word behind it really appears only one other time in Scripture. And that's over in Acts chapter 15 and verse 39. If you're a great Bible student, you can probably get in the mindset and think about what's going on. But I'll, I'll fast forward to it. I got notes. I can tell you what, what's over there. Acts 15 and verse 39, that's where Paul and Barnabas are in disagreement. You remember what they're in disagreement about. John Mark. And you know that in Acts 15 and 39, that is a sharp contention between Paul and Barnabas. And that word contention, that sharp contention that's going on there between Paul and Barnabas is the same word that the Hebrew writer says is that we need to consider one another and stir one another up. That stir up is the same uh, basis in the Greek as the idea there in Acts 15 and 39, that sharp contention between Paul and Barnabas. 10, 24, and 25, interesting picture. The lives of Christians are supposed to be intertwined to such a degree that you help me with my shortcomings, and Lord knows I got a bunch. I help you with your shortcomings, I know you don't have near as many as me. And we do more for the Lord than if we were just left to ourselves. It's more important than the assembly. Just bringing yourselves in here, I like it. I don't want to be anywhere else. I'm glad you're here and made the choice to be here this morning. But... Consider the second point. This stirring up is not going to happen by accident. The stirring up of others is, gonna, is not going to happen without you, without your personal consideration, without your personal concern. How will you and I go about meeting that obligation of Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, stirring one another up, exhorting one another uh, to, to those ideas of love and good works? How are we going to do that? Well, it's going to require... Effort on your part, require effort on my part. You have talented preachers. You have talented and, and wise elders. You have active and, and uh, 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 talented and skilled deacons. And you have those members that, that are, are the, 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 the undergirding of every, those stones, foundational stones built upon the Lord Jesus Christ himself that are, are foundational to the structure of a congregation. You've got plenty of, of those kind of individuals, but the, 
there are still some that are out there looking for what we provide them more than what they can provide. I like to say this way. I don't know that it, that it uh, necessarily applies to this congregation. I bet it does. Well, okay, I don't want to bet that it does, but I believe it does. I like to say to anybody in any congregation uh, when I'm preaching, if you are here this morning and you are looking for a congregation uh, that, that is going to meet your needs in life and that is going to help you feel more connected to God and that is going to, to always make you feel uh, co connected with the body of Christ and is always going to make you uh, leave this place feeling good, I hope that we're that kind of people. But I got news for you. I reckon, I'm thinking we're, we're going to ultimately let you down at some point in your life. But if you come through this, uh, to this assembly, you come to join this group of saints, and you come with the idea that what you want to do is do the best you can do, that you want to take your life and do more for God today than you were doing yesterday, you want to find a congregation that you can make better, then this is your place, and there will always be a job for you. You want to look and see what we provide for you, we're going to disappoint you soon enough. You want to look for what you can provide for us, you will always have a job to do. You will always be able to make us better. And so this is the place for you. Come uh, and, and stir us up uh, to love and good works. But it's not going to happen without personal consideration. Take another look at, at that text 10, 24, and 25. The text tells me we need to be willing Okay, I've been, I've been hard on people that, that come looking for things. Now, let's flop the text over. If you're looking to come here and have all your needs met, I'm not sure that we can ever do that. As talented as this congregation is, you're going to find a, a loophole. But, Go back to Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. It puts an obligation. It doesn't matter what people come here looking for. The obligation on us is to look to them and do our best to stir them up. Do our best to stir each other up. Do our best to see to those needs and especially the ultimate need of the gospel. Notice how Paul says it to Titus. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. That's assembly. Zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort, rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. And so we pause here and we ask the question. I guess I jumped. Will you speak? Or is that somebody else's job? Will you find opportunities today to speak? about the body of Christ in Corsicana, Texas? Will you find opportunities to speak today to relatives that are outside the body of Christ? And we're not going to hound them. We're not going to pester them. We're, we're not going to, to uh, downgrade them or, or, or berate them. But will you speak when the opportunity arises for you to, to present gospel information or, or talk about the church or talk about how good God is? Are you going to speak? Are you going to exhort a little bit different than just speaking? Are you going to actually feel so good about the church, the Lord's church, and, and what God has done for you that you're going to exhort others to do more? And then how about that last one? Uh, will you be like Titus? and actually rebuke. You know, sometimes it's necessary to correct people. False living, false doctrine are going to send souls 
to a terrible, terrible, terrible place. Find no joy in, in identifying sin in the lives of another. I ought not to make it my number one priority in life to find all your sins. I ought to try and find all my own first. But when we do bump together and their sin is, will you rebuke it when it's necessary? Church? See, there's something more important than just coming up here and assembling. You are a part of the speaking process. I know Sam does well at that, and any man that gets behind the pulpit does well at that, and your Bible class teachers do well at that. But there's something more important than just assembly. You get to speak to some people that we will never know in our lifetime. You get to exhort. You get to rebuke. Number three, it's more important than the assembly. We've got to interact with each other. i got no doubt that you do exceedingly well. I, I, I walk around and try to meet as many as I can, and some of you sneak in here at the last minute, and, and I, I, I know how that goes too. God bless you. We're glad you're here. And I, I've had those mornings, and, and, uh, and so I know sometimes it's not easy to get here uh, uh, right at, at, at uh, I mean, before, right at time. But uh, so some of you snuck in. I didn't get a chance to, you didn't sneak in. That's not the right way to say it. You, you got in here without me getting to go over and say hey to you. Okay. What a friendly congregation. You've done well. I don't know you all that well. But could it be that you could do better? Could it be there's some people in this room right now you don't know? Some people in this room right now that you you will not get around to speaking to today. Now, I don't think we ought to be like a bunch of uh, ants on a fire, uh, fire ants on a mound or fruit flies on a banana and that we've all got to just be running around and make sure we get in touch with every single person in this assembly. But we've got to interact to e with each other. See, the Hebrew writer does not say, brethren, the elders are responsible for the stimulation of love and good works in a congregation. The, the New Testament does not say, you know that you need to have the proper deacons in place in order for everybody else to be really stirred up and actively involved in the lives of others uh, and that you've got to have a, an activities uh, a minister and a, and, a, and a minister for this and a minister for that. I think there's great wisdom in that and, and there is a place for those things. That's not my point. But the New Testament doesn't say that, that you've got to have Bible class teachers that are the ones that make sure children learn the Bible, etc. They're all expedient matters and matters of good judgment. But what the New Testament does teach us, Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Preacher ought to help me do that. My elders ought to be, be actively involved in programs and making decisions that are going to help us do that. Deacons need to fire us up and give us the, the spark. I, I like to call them spark plugs in a congregation, and, or I like the, the idea of them being called spark plugs. And they, their part's vital. Y young people uh, play a vital role as well. I, I warned these folks that are down there in spitting distance this morning. Say by the bell. Uh, and uh, so far, so good, right? I haven't seen anybody cringe. What a, what a great... What a great encouragement those things are. But what the New Testament says is, if you're expecting them to do it, you've missed it. Let us stir up one another in order to provoke love and good work. 
I don't know if this congregation is, is like um, the congregation back at Howe. And I love, I love the Howe congregation. But there are some folks <laughs> that come to the assembly that Houdini's got nothing on them. Now, for those of you that don't, do y'all know Houdini? David Blaine. How about that? It'd be better. David Blaine. David Blaine Houdini got nothing on them. The final bell sounds, and poof, they're gone. You, you got to break your neck to try to get a hold of them before they get outside. The, you got to throw yourself in front of their car sometimes. Now, I know that maybe they got things to do, and their lives are complicated, and so we're not talking about that. But we're talking about there are some people that they are just not going to stick around any longer than they have to. We must interact with one another. Uh, we, we have to, to uh, give, give time and effort. To, look at what Paul says to the uh, church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. What have I got? Four, three, two, one minute, something like that. Somewhere three minutes, Sam knows exactly what I got. Uh, look at Ephesians 4, verse 11. Uh, if you're still with me on the point, more important than the assembly, and, and, and now we're here on, on the third point that we're making to you is we've got to interact with one another. And I don't just mean coming by and shaking hands and saying, hey, how you doing? That's good stuff. It means something. Notice, he gave, him, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. Okay, first century, miraculous abilities, certainly those things are involved, but they meant something to the Ephesians first, but they, can, they certainly mean things to us today. I want you to go back now and look at the text again. What in the world did God give apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for? The equipping of the saints. Evidently, pastors can't do it all by themselves. Evidently, evangelists can't do it all by themselves. Evidently, Bible class teachers can't do it all by themselves. In conjunction, when we interact with one another... It is for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Go back to Hebrews 10, 24, 25. In fact, would you open your New Testament to that passage? Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And as our time expires, we're going to come down and get another verse or two. Verse 19, having, the, having boldness to enter the holy, holiest by the blood of Jesus. Verse 21, we've got, or 20, we've got a new and living way. Verse 21, we've got a high priest over the house of God. And because of that, he says... Let us draw near with a true heart. Let us hold fast the confession, verse 23, uh, verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now here it is. Keep going. See, it's more, there's something more important than the assembly. For if we sin willfully, he didn't say if they sin willfully. He said if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no, lang no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversary. I have no doubt those outside the body of Christ stand to inherit weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hebrews 10, 24, all the way down, 26, 27, says, if Christians aren't careful, 
They stand in here the same. Some things are more important than the assembly. God bless you.